Matt asked me to talk about flexion instability. And, uh, you know, we went over this case in the uh, session, so some of this will be redundant, so I'll go through this. This is my disclosures. So we all know that the goal of balancing a knee is to have symmetric flexion extension gaps medially and laterally throughout the range of motion. I should mention to you that these aren't my creations of uh, artwork. Of course, Dr. Abdel driving the medical graphics people crazy, but they're really beautiful. So you can see here, flexion instability is an open flexion gap in flexion. The problem with this is, is it's misunderstood and it's more of a syndrome because people can have loose knees and be okay, but for the people that truly have a problem with it, most of these patients uh, get, you got a perfect knee, x-rays look great, all you can do is exchange, never operate on them, and only have the CR, it goes on and on. The way we discovered this is we were getting all these patients with weird infections back in the early 90s, which were actually flexion instability instead of you know, a weird infection that somebody couldn't grow out. So we have a long history here of articles with first CR and then both, and then Matt, I'll discuss the one that Matt and I did recently, and then maybe in the discussion, there's some more data now on flexion instability that's in submission from uh, this institution. One of the things you'll hear from these people is, my therapist said I was the best patient ever in therapy. I got my motion faster than anybody else. Yeah, well, it's pretty easy when you don't have any flexion uh, stability. They, most of them have recurrent effusions, and they really will complain about going downstairs or down a grade. That's a rough and uneven ground. They don't trust their knee. And, uh, and then they have all these little tender spots that are tender around the knee. This is Matt doing examination. You can see we talked in the discussion, but you can see the patients on the ta uh, table with their foot on the floor that he's supporting so he can relax the quadriceps, showing how to uh, examine that patient. And uh, the knock test we talked about is you reach up underneath the thigh and you flip the sort of have the tibia dangle like this so you can feel it bouncing from side to side. One of the things that's important about this is it's very, very common that when you aspirate the knee, there's blood in the aspiration. Radiographically, there's a lot of signs. You can see under resection of the posterior condyle. You can see small implants and then a distalized implant. In the far right, that's what we call the so-called double bubble sign because when you measure the epicondyle down to that surface, on this one it was like 38 millimeters when it should be only 22. They just didn't resurface enough of the distal femur to put that implant on. So this is what the double bubble sign looks like. This is a really important slide. Kenny Krakow, a long time ago, they took, he and a fellow took a bunch of cadavers, and they did all the cuts. And so you can see on the far left, they had equal extension flexion gaps. Then what they did is they did multiple puncture wounds and damage just to the collaterals, and the extension gap only opened up 21 to 21, but the flexion gap went up to 30. And then when they disrupted or expanded the posterior capsule, the extension gap only went to 24, whereas the flexion gap went out to 45. So that's what happens in a revision knee that has a flexion instability that gets recurrent effusions. They continue to stretch out. They stretch their collaterals. They stretch the posterior capsule. And when you see them, there's a centimeter or so discrepancy at least between the gaps. It's not because the surgeon did entirely the wrong thing. This is a progressive uh, problem with the instability. So if you're going to operate on these people, and we can maybe talk about whether you should or shouldn't operate on these people, but if you do, you should go in with a plan. And the plan is make sure you have good axial alignment. As you'll see, rotation is often needs to be corrected, as it is in many revision situations. And then we'll start with correcting the tibial slope and then addressing an undersized femur in those four steps in that sequence. So correct malrotation alignment, neutralize the tibial slope, then you increase the size of the femur as much as you possibly can with your system, and then if you still have an imbalance, you start riding the joint line up to put a thicker poly in to have a good tight extension and flexion gap. That's the four steps that you do, and you go through that sequentially. So you can see in this case, the patient has a posterior slope of 21 degrees that gets reduced to 3.6, the offset goes from 24.2 up to 31, 
and the distalized femur there at 36.8 goes down to 23.5. So that's not an elevated joint line. That is actually a normal joint line. Even though it looks like, wow, they really elevated the joint line. That's where it should be, and you don't have the double bubble. <clears throat> this is an example of an attorney from the East Coast that comes in. And he, had, he was on Coumadin and had, kept having recurrent hemarthrosis. So he got a bunch of arthroscopies, liner exchange, and he comes to me, of course, with a 15-degree flexion uh, contracture and still having recurrent bleeds. And if you just look at his x-ray, you can see he's got axomel alignment. Um, and I don't, you can see in the AP, that's a small femur. It could have been a lot bigger femur, so they could have had more AP sizing. And look at the slope on that, a, a, a huge slope. And um, when you go back, what we've done, and we've done multiple things there. We corrected the tibial slope. We've increased the offset. We've elevated that joint line, a lot thicker poly. That's how that problem got solved. So the last paper that was published here on this, you can see we looked at all these different variables. And you can see uh, the distance from the, uh, in the epi, uh, how we decreased that. And the bottom line in all this is you add it up. We corrected more than 10 millimeters in a combined way to try to get control of that flexion space. And on this slide, it's sort of busy, but I wanted to show you that it's very common for us to elevate the joint line from what it was at 87%, but 70% of the time, we determined that we thought that the uh, components were rotated. Now, the question is, is that causative, or is that an association where the surgeon who doesn't know how to do flexion extension balancing also malrotates? And it's hard to know, but that's probably a combination of both. So the surgical sequence for this, correcting malrotational alignment, neutralizing the slope, upsizing the femur, and then dealing with the joint line to equalize flexion and extension. It's pretty straightforward. It's just that most people don't think about this in a logical, sequential way. Um, so in conclusion, distinct history and exam. Remember about hemarthrosis being diagnostic and using a logical stepwise surgical plan. Thank you very much.